Right, okay. Um, I'm going to uh, basically posit the hypothesis that coal is not dead, but it's uh, certainly terminally ill. <laughs> um, and I'm going to look at that from the point of view of credit and uh, credit implications of the uh, stranded asset debate. Um, you know, I want to work for Standard & Poor's. We focus on uh, credit quality. Um, and it really is important to stress that when we look at uh, coal miners, that uh, two-thirds of coal miners are rated non-investment grade. Uh, in other words, that the risk of default over a 10-year period, not paying your debt back on time and in full, is somewhere over 60%. Okay? So two-thirds of coal miners in the world that we rate, obviously we don't rate all of them, are non-investment grade. More importantly, a fifth of all rated coal miners are triple C plus, which is basically scraping the barrel. So when we hear that it's hard to talk to US coal miners because they're going bankrupt, that explains why. Um, but it's also important to look at this from a perspective of what Mark Carney calls the tragedy of the horizons. Um, often thrown back at us saying that we look at uh, credit risk issues from too much of a short-term perspective, that we need to take into account the longer-term issues of which climate change is one of the, uh, the major factors. Uh, but I'm going to argue that this whole issue of carbon constraints and the impact it's having on the coal sector is not just a long-term issue. It's not even just a medium-term issue. It's a short-term issue. Right, so starting off with why we think that. Well, first of all, the use of coal. Uh, we've heard a lot about the use of coal. It's a double-edged sword, we'd argue. Effectively, coal consumption is increasing and it was likely to continue to increase. Uh, we see coal consumption rising by around 3.9% between the year 2000 and 2013. And, you know, if we look at it in terms of what that means in terms of coal-fired plant, an additional 200 megawatts of plant has been added every day on average during that period, between 2000 and 2014. Bear in mind, the average lifespan of those plants is around 40 years. And coal will continue to increase in importance. Uh, and, you know, there will be uh, an increase by the year 2019 to around 9 billion tonnes in terms of consumption. So that's what we see in terms of coal consumption over the short to medium term. It, it will continue to increase. So this is the short to medium term picture. And that's because coal is, you know, a very important part of the energy mix, uh, responsible for around, uh, you know, two thirds or so of energy production. And you know, at the same time, responsible for about 40% of the world's CO2 emissions. So you've got a, a double-edged sword characteristics there. But what we've tried to do as well, uh, is not just look at the short term, but look at the longer term issues in terms of carbon constraints. Uh, and this is based on, on the analysis and uh, also help of Carbon Tracker, who collaborated with us in the initial version of this paper. Uh, looking at the IEA um, uh, policy scenarios, uh, you see here that the, uh, the new policy uh, scenario, the blue line, uh, will actually uh, lead to uh, um, increasing temperatures like you about 3.6 degrees, um, you know, which uh, is actually better than the uh, current policies. But one thing that is worth uh, focusing on is, is this scenario here, 450 ppm. Now, the 450 ppm, most of you will recognise as being the one which gives you a 50% chance of limiting the world temperature rise to 2 degrees by 2035. Now, what is required to get to that? Well, it's argued energy efficiency policies. Tick. Limiting the use of inefficient coal power. Tick. Increasing the usage of renewables and nuclear power. Tick. Now, I'm not saying we are there already. But what I'm saying is there is a trajectory to get there. Uh, whether we will get there or not is, is very debatable. But the 450 ppm uh, policy scenario, while it's uh, you know, subject to some scepticism, it's not totally <coughs> unfeasible. Oops, sorry. Going back. What does that mean? Well, let's go back from the long term to the medium term. Now, China, uh, we argue, is the real game changer in this debate. 
Uh, it represents 45% of the global demand for coal. Um, and what's been happening in China is really quite interesting of late. Uh, as you see from this uh, chart here, we've got a, um, basically an increasing consumption uh, of coal, and that will continue to increase, uh, we believe, uh, about 3.5% per annum around, uh, to 2020, based on Chinese stated policies. Um, but at the same time, you can see there that Chinese net coal imports have started to decrease. Now that has quite important uh, ramifications. Uh, Chinese coal consumption will decrease after 2020, that's our stated belief. Uh, and you know, the fact that we are getting to see already a, uh, a decrease in coal imports has a, an interesting impact on other coal exporting countries, notably Australia, Indonesia, and the US. So China, because of its importance in terms of the world's coal demand, has really huge ramifications in terms of the coal sector globally. And that's the first point that we need to bear in mind. Moving from China to the US. Now the US energy mix has been in transition for some time and it's undergone quite a fundamental transition in the short term. Um, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about regulation, but it really is important to stress that the Clean Power Plan uh, aims to cut uh, coal uh, CO2 emissions from the power sector by 32% by 2030. So we've got a, uh, this is uh, the implications of that. You see that the uh, coal mix by 2030 decreasing significantly in the US energy mix as a result of that. From our research suggests that the share of coal-fueled electricity generation will actually fall from 38% to 27% over that period. So that's a, a significant shift in the US energy mix. What does that mean for the coal industry? Well, here we have the Appalachian <coughs> output uh, in terms of where it's been going since 97, and you can see where we think it's likely to go by 2018, so a relatively short time frame. So because the average coal-fired plant produces more than one and a half times the amount of carbon allowed under the new regulation, we're starting to see plans for retirement. Retirement in the order of 60 gigawatts of the country's coal-fired capacity by 2060. That's equal to about 80 to 90 million tonnes of coal in the US will be re retired. Now what's that going to mean for the US coal sector? I mentioned right at the beginning um, where it is in terms of its credit quality. Around two-thirds is non-investment grade, a fifth is rated triple C uh, or below. <clears throat> so what we will argue is that uh, essentially it's not looking good for the coal industry uh, in the US at all. And the US energy mix has shifted, uh, partly because of the shale gas revolution, but also because uh, of uh, environmental or carbon constraints coming in, such as the Clean Power Plan. Uh, coal production is decreasing, uh, and the way around this, which the US coal sector has hoped or has hung its hat on, is to increase exports. But it's not looking good in that respect either. So the US coal industry is actually caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, currently, US coal miners export around 110 million tonnes of coal per annum. Uh, but we're going to see that shrinking to around 80 million tonnes of coal per annum. Now, why is that? Well, essentially because of price. Um, it's, uh, it can't compete, and uh, as a result of that, it's got no outlet for its coal. Uh, that, we believe, is going to be uh, leading to the real risk of stranding in the US coal sector, and within a relatively short time frame. Let's move away from the US uh, to closer to home and Poland. We've heard a little bit about Poland already. Uh, and what's interesting here is that, um, you know, what's driving the coal dynamics in Poland are quite, quite different. We're, we're, as has uh, been mentioned, it's more to do with domestic issues, geopolitical, security of supply. But what's clear is that, as you see from this table, <coughs> domestic production of coal in Poland, although albeit small compared to, uh, say, China or other countries, is, has declined considerably, um, while at the same time you can see that it's moving from an export to an import position uh, in terms of its uh, coal for thermal uh, generation. So we are seeing in Poland 
uh, a situation where it's unsustainable, essentially. The, the coal industry can't carry on like this. Um, it needs to rely on government subsidies to keep going. Um, EU state aid rules will catch up with it eventually. Uh, it can't continue like this. And uh, geopolitical tensions uh, uh, will only increase. It can't just rely on importing coal from Russia, uh, given the tensions that we're seeing escalating there. So the, uh, the coal industry in Poland will have to restructure significantly, which will also put an intense credit pressure on coal producers there. So what we've seen here is uh, fundamental differences between China, the US, and countries like Poland, but they're all interrelated. So, so just to conclude, um, you know, I'm oh, sorry, move back. The global coal industry faces, we believe, transformative challenges. Uh, we think that obviously gas is going to rival coal going forward, um, and the China energy mix uh, and the shift towards renewables and the slowing economy is going to have a dramatic impact in terms of consumption and also the amount of imports that China takes in terms of coal, with consequences for countries like Australia, uh, the US, and Indonesia. And that uh, regulation and policies such as the US Clean Power Plan have had a fundamental effect in terms of stranding assets for the US coal miners. There are other factors at play which need to be considered, and I'll leave you with these. Um, the balance uh, of coal demand globally is somewhat in, uh, going to be dictated by what happens in other countries in Asia, especially India. Uh, India is uh, still importing coal and uh, it could be actually one that uh, hangs the, uh, the balance of the scales in terms of future coal demand and pricing. Um, and also, uh, if India and uh, countries like Indonesia and others don't uh, actually sign up to tight uh, emission pledges, that also could have a, a, a quite a significant impact on the uh, coal sector. And moving away from coal will take time, we believe. Um, so in the short term, uh, we're not going to see a, a dramatic uh, shift away from the usage of coal for fossil fuel generation uh, or thermal generation. But if we go to, uh, to 2020 and beyond, yes, that will be the case. And there will be some clear-cut examples such as Poland where there are other factors at play such as energy security and geopolitical risk. Um, and then finally, as we've just heard from uh, the previous uh, um, paper, uh, technology is likely to play an important part going forward. Uh, whether it's advanced technology in terms of increasing the efficiency of coal plants. Uh, for example, if you improve a plant from uh, by moving to supercritical coal uh, power production, uh, you increase the efficiency from 33 to around 45%. Uh, that <coughs> will decrease the world's CO2 emissions by around 10%. So that is a, a, a real game changer, we believe. And of course, uh, we've heard about CCS. Um, CCS has a potential to <laughs> reduce emissions by 80 to 90 percent, uh, but also um, it has an impact on in increasing usage of coal by about 25 to 40 percent. So CCS is still uh, up in the balance, and, uh, but technology will play a part uh, in our view. So I'll leave it at that, and uh, happy to take any clarification, please. Thank you.